Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Mr. Wes O'Donnell. All right. Thank you guys, thank you very much. It's my last day here at the Academy and I'm sad to go. It's been amazing. Everybody here has been the very definition of professional. Uh, one thing that uh, we, we left off of the bio is that uh, I'm now shooting a documentary called The Forgotten regarding the way the Vietnam veterans were treated once they returned home from Vietnam. And I think it's going to be great. It's going to be out this fall. So I'm looking forward to hopefully you guys checking it out when it comes out. So I ran into a friend in the hallway and she said, Wes, why do you always start your talks with a joke? And I said, well, jokes bring the room together, right? So when everybody laughs, I can see this beam of light sort of envelop the room and connect it to the back and everybody's on the same page. So you ready? All right. So there was a single engine fighter that called the tower for a priority landing because his engine was running a bit peaked. The tower said, negative Falcon, you're number two behind a B-52 that has one engine shut down. Falcon pilot said, ah yes, the dreaded seven engine approach. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing, all right. <laughs> How can you tell when there's an Air Force pilot at a party? Don't worry, he'll tell you. There we go, all right. Okay, clearly I'm not a stand-up comedian. Um, why am I really here? I'm a motivator, I wanna motivate you guys. I really enjoy doing that. So anyone can start something, but very few people finish. You, my friends, are finishers. You see, I know something about you even not knowing you. Based on my experience, I've come to the conclusion that because of your relationship with the profession of arms, that you are much more likely to achieve your wildest dreams of success after you separate. The problem is that some of you don't know it yet. Yeah, but Wes, what if my dream is too big? It's not. It's not. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men. You see, someone in this room right now is going to be the first person to set foot on Mars. Someone in this room right now is going to be the CEO of your own Fortune 500 company that you create. Someone in this room right now is going to be President of the United States. Impossible? There's a new generation of veterans, the post 9-11 veterans. They're smart, smarter than any generation that's come before. They're technologically advanced, and in the next two decades, they're gonna be responsible for the largest economic boom in US history. Many of you will one day be veterans, and more importantly, many of you will be leading airmen who will one day be veterans. So I want to change your perception of success. And I want to give you the motivation to make this your decade. All right, do me a favor right now. Turn to the person to your left or right, look them in the eye, shake their hand and say, you've got the right stuff. Do that for me now, please. <laughs> you've got the right stuff. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Get you guys warmed up. I know it's early. All right, so my mentor, Les Brown, told me that most of us go through life pretending that we don't have any dreams or ambitions or desires when really, deep down inside, we do really want more. We block ourselves and we use these words almost like we're in a trance like we're sleepwalking through life, that we find ways to cancel out our dreams, that a lot of things we want to do, a lot of places we would like to go, a lot of things we want to experience, and we just stop at but. 
but will cause you to hide out behind fear, but will cause you to come up with all types of excuses that you can validate your inaction and not acting on your dream. But is a dream killer. But most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely, tiptoeing to an early grave. We've been holding back. We have ideas that we don't act on, things we want to do, we're afraid to take chances. See, a lot of people say no to things, and they don't even know what they're saying no to. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner. Now, there are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice, and it didn't work out. So they used that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Look, if things don't work out, if you don't produce the results you want, that's fine. But don't confuse who you are with the results that you produce. Do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. Don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, that you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. Why don't you decide now that you're going to expand your world? That if other people can learn, you can learn too. See, if you're working on your dream, Sure, there are going to be times when you're going to want to quit. Sure, there are going to be times when life will knock you down and catch you on the blind side. But the challenge is, is to hold on. And if you hold on tenaciously, I say the universe is on your side. See, if you don't make a decision to act on your dreams, if you don't decide to live your life, if you don't make a decision to step into your fears, if you don't decide to say yes to your life, It'll never work for you. You've got to live what's in you. Life is too short and unpredictable. Helen Keller said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat your dessert first. But what do we say? It'll always be tomorrow. There are no guarantees you're going to be here tomorrow. Always something there to build a case on why you can't move on, why you can't grow to the next level, why you can't begin to live life on your terms, why you can't begin to manifest your greatness. But you're going to say, it's not worth it? Yes, it's going to be right there for you. It's going to be in your face telling you to go back. So if there's something you've always wanted to do, the time for just wishing is past. Time for doing, that's the time right now. So let's define success. Let me tell you what society says you have to do to be successful. And this applies to 97% of the US population. Graduate high school, it's a good first start. Go to college or join the military. Get a good job. Save for retirement. Retire. And then die gracefully. That's it. That defines success for a very large percentage of the American population. The thing is, life can be so much more broad than that when you realize all of the stuff that we see around us was made up of people who were no smarter than you. Now, success could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Let me tell you my definition of success. Success to me means finding that thing that truly makes you happy and then finding someone to pay you to do that thing or do it well enough to pay yourself. I want you to look at your life right now and think about something that's important to you. Something that gives your life a sense of value. Think of something that you'd like to have or something that you'd like to create for yourself or for society. Maybe there's something in life that you've talked yourself out of. Bring it back out here. How are you going to do it? Don't worry about that right now. You'll become the type of person that can attract the people, the resources to help make it happen. The key here is deciding that you're going to do it. What gives your life a sense of fulfillment, a sense of joy? What is it that you can love doing seven days a week that'll bring a smile to your face? I got bad news for some of you. If it's Monday and the only thing you look forward to is Friday, you're in the wrong job. You're in the wrong job. Time to face yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, 
what do I want to be? Success doesn't require that you look out the window. It only requires that you look in the mirror. Horace Mann said that we should be ashamed to die until we have left some meaningful contribution to humankind. Leadership starts with you guys. We're standing here in, in the US Air Force Academy. Leadership starts with you. But how can you expect to lead anybody if you can't take charge of your own destiny? Reminds me of a story of a dog that was lying on a pile of wood. And the dog was moaning and groaning and howling in pain. This guy walks up to the owner and he says, hey man, why is this dog here lying, moaning and groaning in pain? And the owner says, well, I guess it don't hurt that bad. So raise your hand if you know somebody that moans and groans about their place in life, but doesn't actually get up and do anything about it, right? My job sucks. Man, my boss is so stupid, right? That was me. I worked at a large German medical company that shall remain nameless, although you can probably see the logo on that badge around my neck. And I came home and I told my wife, I said, wife, my boss is so stupid. Uh, I can't stand working for this dude, he's just stupid. And she told me, she said, well, if he's so stupid, why is he the one signing your paycheck? And then it hit me. It was like an idea. Imagine, imagine getting an idea in 360 degrees. Imagine being hit like uh, an, an epiphany, like a diamond bullet right between the eyes. And I'm lucky that I had this epiphany in my 30s. My boss runs a successful company. I'm smarter than my boss. I could run a successful company. So take a look at this picture. This is me, right? And I was working for this company. I had a very good salary. Corvette, nice house, beautiful wife, of course. And do I look happy in this picture? Mm -mm. Not at all. All the material objects in the world will not make you happy if you're not becoming the person that you've been born to be. If you're not doing the job that you've been born to do. And I see this all the time. Stop living your life like you have a thousand years to live. What's the saying? Here today, gone today, right? A lot of people that were here yesterday aren't here today. A lot of opportunities that were here yesterday aren't here today. So why do most people wait or not act at all? So I'm working on a book right now. This is Rise, my last book, available at Barnes and Noble. <coughs> and I'm working on a book right now, and I haven't announced it yet, but I'll give you guys a sneak peek. Over the past six months, I've gone out and interviewed 100 self-made millionaires, um, about half of which are actually military veterans. And I wanted to find out what made them successful. What did they credit with achieving their goals and their dreams, of doing that job that truly made them happy and the money came as a byproduct. The money came as sort of a side effect. What I discovered was that one word, certainty, made the difference between success and failure. When someone is absolutely certain about something or an outcome, when the result is already a foregone conclusion, all that's left is the execution. And the people that failed all had one thing in common. They weren't absolutely certain that if they take this action, they're going to get that result, right? It was this wishy-washy, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but I'm going to give it the old college try. You have to have certainty that you're on the right path, and you have to be able to visualize the outcome. You want to visualize yourself doing that thing that you want to do. Visualize yourself receiving that promotion. There's a well-known experiment by a doctor in the, at the University of Chicago where he split basketball players into three groups. And he had the first group try and improve their free throw percentage. So he had the first group do absolutely nothing but practice shooting free throws for 20 minutes a day. That's it. The second group, he had just stand there, close their eyes, and visualize shooting the perfect free throw. 
Every basket, perfect, perfect free throw every single time. And the third group he had do nothing at all. The results were amazing. The first group that actually practiced increased their free throw percentage by 30%. The second group that just visualized shooting the perfect free throw increased their percentage by 29%. Now I'm not trying to advocate not practicing, but imagine the power of combining that visualization with physical practice. And of course the third group, as you would expect, had no increase at all. You have to see the end result before it's actually a reality. You have to believe with absolute certainty that you are something that you're not before you are. Visualize yourself receiving that promotion. Visualize yourself receiving that award. It sounds crazy. It sounds like new age nonsense, but I'm a believer. It works. Athletes do this all the time, but what about the rest of us? So I have a friend who used to be an operator. Uh, now he's the DOD special agent for counterterrorism operations, CONUS. That's probably the coolest job title ever. And he confirmed to me, yeah, we sure enough, we, we run through, mentally, we run through the house visually, seeing where we need to go uh, until we have it down. And the only thing that's required once we actually perform is the body executes what the brain has already done a million times. Navy pilots uh, definitely visualize the perfect carrier landing over and over in their head. Prime the brain and the body follows. Now for me personally, I left the Air Force in 2007. Uh, and I went to work for this German medical company, and I used to work on MRI machines. That was my job. I fixed MRI machines. And I used to bring two magazines with me to work. I used to bring an auto trader, and I used to bring an entrepreneur magazine. And I would look at these cars, uh, in particular the Corvette Stingray, and I would, I would say, like, I'm going to drive this car. Like, in three years, I'm going to own this car. I'm going to drive this car. I could feel the hand-stitched leather in my mind. I felt like I was driving it. And my friends, my colleagues would laugh at me, and they'd say, Wes, that's a $90,000 car. There's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to afford that on our salary. And I said, that's exactly right. I'm not going to do it on our salary. That's what the Entrepreneur Magazine was for. So I can learn what other successful people are doing to be successful. That's my baby now. I call her the Queen Anne's Revenge. Two. The first one's at the bottom of the Atlantic. Yeah, it works. You have to be certain of the outcome. I was absolutely certain that that was going to be my vehicle. So how do you get started? What if, what if you know what you want to do, but your dream is too big? Um, I'm going to be president of the United States. That's my goal in life. That's what I want to do. But that's such a huge dream. That's such a huge goal. How do you get started on that? I would give you this advice. I would say just do a little bit of it. Just set aside a little time each day and just do a little bit of it until you start to become more and more confident, right? I like the old quote by the yard is hard, but inch by inch, anything is a cinch. What is it, it what if you don't know what it is that you want to do yet? You know that you're meant for greatness, right? I mean, you know what you want to do in the near term graduate, go out and have a, a high-performing military career, but there's something else that's scratching at the back of your brain. You just don't know what it is yet. I would say try everything. Try everything. How many Mozarts or Beethovens has the world missed out on? Because nobody ever sat down in front of a piano. What if they were a prodigy? How many Einsteins did the human species lose to history because nobody ever picked up a physics book because they went to work for the family business instead. You don't know what you don't know. And you have to try everything. There's this minister named Miles Monroe. It once said the wealthiest place on earth. It's not the Middle East where they have oil in the ground. It's not South Africa where they have diamond mines. The wealthiest place on earth is actually the cemetery. Because in the cemetery lies all of the dreams and goals 
and million dollar ideas that people took with them to their graves. You have talents and skills inside you that you haven't even begun to reach for yet. And most people don't move on their dreams because they don't believe that it's possible for them. They don't have faith in themselves. They need to see somebody else do it first. In 19, before 1968, no human had ever run 100 meters in under 10 seconds. We thought it was a physiological limitation of our species. Humans just can't do it. We can't fly, we don't have wings, and even if we did, our pectoral muscles aren't strong enough to generate lift. Then, in 1968, a man named Jim Hines comes along and breaks the 10 second barrier. 100 meters in under 10 seconds. Someone had done it, so in theory, anyone can do it. Right? Since then, 105 people have broken the 10 second barrier. What changed? We knew it was possible. It's possible. We, we know that it can be done now. We just saw somebody do it. So now when these athletes took to the field in their brains, they weren't hindered by any kind of preconceived notion. We know it can be done. 105 people then went out and did it. Sometimes we need to see the person doing that thing that we want to do, and that inspires us. All right, do me a favor. Turn to the person to your left or right, look them in the eye, shake their hand, and say, you've got no limits. Do that for me now, please. You've got no limits, sir. No limits. All right. All right. So, where do veterans come in? We're talking about the profession of arms, right? Where do veterans come in? President Barack Obama is the 44th president of the United States. However, there have actually only been 43 men that have held the position because I think Grover Cleveland ran two non-consecutive terms. Somebody have to fact check that for me. So out of 43 presidents, out of 43 men, how many were military veterans? Any guesses? Anybody? Anybody? Well, you, guys, you guys are all over the place. All right. The majority, the majority of U.S. presidents have been military veterans, have served their country, 26 out of 43. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say that if you're a military veteran, you have a higher likelihood of being voted commander in chief than your civilian counterparts. Of course, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into that. Some of our best presidents have been veterans. Ronald Reagan, Abraham Lincoln was a veteran. Of course, Theo Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy, my favorite president, Kennedy. Our very first president, George Washington, of course, was a military veteran. So what's stopping you if that's your goal? Don't be afraid to shoot for these seemingly impossible, ridiculous goals that nobody ever thinks they can achieve. We need people, in my opinion, we need people with military experience leading this country. And we need people with military experience in business. We've seen it in the past so that we know it's possible. Furthermore, success-minded veterans are also largely responsible for the massive economic boom of the 1950s. In 1944, that GI Bill helped World War II veterans return home and buy homes, get an education, buy farms, start businesses. My own grandfather, pictured here, Corsair pilot for the Marine Corps in World War II, uh, shot down exactly five, he was an ace, shot down exactly five Japanese zeros in 1945, came home to Dallas, Texas and opened a dry cleaners. That's exactly what I'm talking about. The most important part is that veterans were and are 50% more likely to be active in their communities and civic associations. And in the 50s and 60s, many veterans joined the civil rights movement to expand human rights for future generations. If we're not all equal, they thought, then what the hell are we fighting for? So why, what qualities do veterans 
and people in the profession of arms possess? What qualities do we possess that make us more likely to achieve success in life? Leadership at every level. At age 19, I was put in charge of $6 million of government equipment. I had friends who were in their 20s appointed governors of entire towns in the Middle East. There is no better anvil on the planet to forge a 21st century leader than where you are right now. Hands down, that's it. Drop the mic and walk out. It's in our DNA, it's what we do. Are there good leaders outside of the US military experience? Of course there are, but I would argue that they're fewer and farther between. Composure and creativity under pressure. You guys may have just seen this. I think Air Force Times just reported on this, but it's a perfect example of creativity under pressure. Uh, there was an F-16 recently that uh, had a malfunction where it could only hold 500 pounds of fuel at a time. And he was gonna have to eject over ISIS controlled territory. Now, I was in the infantry and then I was a maintainer in the Air Force, so I don't know what the mind of a fighter pilot is. But in my mind, there are very few things that a pilot fears. Ejecting over ISIS controlled territory is probably one of them. So what happened? The KC-135 tanker stepped up and escorted the F-16 back to base, refueling him every 15 minutes. This is the very definition of composure and creativity under pressure. And there are hundreds of examples of this happening every day in the US military, in every branch. And in society, as entrepreneurs in particular, I've seen veterans go well beyond the stress point where their civilian counterparts would break. All right, integrity first. I got some flack for this yesterday in, the, in a speech yesterday because if it's integrity first, why is it the third slide? I should have rearranged it. Integrity is important. We talk about that all the time, right? I would, I, would, I would go ahead and argue, based on my personal experience, that veterans operate at a higher level of integrity in the civilian world. And I'm going to give you an example. When I worked for the same German medical company, we had a device called a head fixation device. And what it did was it screwed into a child's skull to hold the child's skull completely motionless so that a doctor can remove a brain tumor. So my team discovered a defect with the HFD that could potentially cause the child's head to move during surgery, which could have been fatal to a child. I took it to my CEO, this wonderful man, and he said, the likelihood of that failing is very low. It would cost us millions of dollars to recall. We're not gonna do it. And I'm swearing you under a non-disclosure agreement that you won't talk to anybody about this, which I'm doing right now. I left a week later. I didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement. I do not work for that company. Integrity, having veterans enter the workforce with integrity is so huge. And there are a lot of people in the civilian world making millions of dollars and they're doing it without integrity but you can also do it with integrity and it's much more, much more fulfilling and you'll actually be able to sleep at night. In my personal dealings with veterans in business, I've seen men and women in the civilian world that operate out of a clear sense of right and wrong and service before self. It's not just a pretty value system that we try and put into your heads. It's real and it really works in the civilian world especially. Habitual goal orientation, that's my jet when I was a maintainer, the flower of 1970s technology, right there. So any success so-called guru will talk to you about the importance of setting goals. Of course it's important. A goal must require you to take action, not reaction. What they don't tell you is that massive action gets massive results. You have to try everything. Throw enough stuff against the wall and something's going to stick. Then they leave the military and they bring this habitual goal orientation with them. They also bring something called the AAR, or After Action Report. In the Air Force, it's called the debrief, where you look at the last mission, you look at things that went right or wrong, 
and you have this positive feedback loop where you learn lessons and you apply them to the next time you're performing that task or doing that mission. And in the business world, that results in revenue. And you know what? Many, many businesses, many Fortune 500 businesses that you would assume are doing this aren't doing this. My favorite is diversity and inclusion in action. And that's mainly because I was in the military in total from 97 to 2007. And in my entire time in the military, I didn't see racism. I didn't, I didn't see it. I, I didn't perceive it happening, at least not in the units that I was in. I'm sure it happens, not in the units that I was in. So in my mind, racism is dead. Whew, thank God, it's over. 1969 is behind us. Then I leave the military, and I stroll into uh, 2007 America, and it's very much alive and well. And the important thing for you is that we learn to work without regard to uh, differences in race, uh, in gender, and religion. We, we, don't, we still focus on mission accomplishment when we do that. And in 1965, a black Vietnam soldier named Milton Olive III was on patrol with his squad in Vietnam. When they made contact with the Viet Cong, the Viet Cong fled, but not before they turned and threw a hand grenade. PFC Milton Olive nonchalantly said, I got it, reached down, picked it up, tucked it into his chest, and laid down on it. PFC Olive was awarded posthumously the Medal of Honor when he tucked that grenade into his chest. And jumping on that grenade, he saved the lives of a squad, both black men and white men, without a thought. And in doing so, taught us how we ought to live. Now, America has been called a melting pot because of all these different nationalities, cultures, ethnicities, genders. It's called a melting pot, and if I can just Stand on my soapbox for a second. I don't like the term melting pot because in my mind, when everything gets put into a melting pot, it all turns into the same sort of homogenous goo. Everything turns the same color, consistency. I prefer to think of America as like a delicious chef's salad where there are different parts of a salad. They all are distinct. They all taste delicious. But everything still has its own flavor. Make absolutely no mistake, America is powerful because of its diversity, right? Different people bring with them a wealth of different experiences. And in 21st century America, when we face numerous, very fast changing challenges out there on the global stage, our diversity allows us to adapt, I would argue, much more quickly than many other countries. And soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines know better than anyone that mission accomplishment doesn't care about race, religion, or gender. So what are we seeing today? I'm just going to run through a couple of examples of some post 9-11 veterans that are currently succeeding in the civilian world in a number of different industries. So this here is, when I first left uh, that German medical company we were talking about, I started my own business. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. So I started a company called MD Advantages Healthcare. And I had this great idea. I want to do a medical cart that could turn into any other medical cart. Um, when I was working at this medical company, I noticed doctors and nurses uh, always looking around for the right medical cart. They had a crash cart, but they needed a pediatric cart, or they needed an anesthesia cart. Nobody could ever find the one that they needed. So I said, what if the cart were modular? What if the drawer module could be interchanged very quickly to provide the cart that they need? After all, they were wasting 30, 45 minutes looking for the right cart. That's time that could be better spent improving patient care. So after this back of the napkin sketch, back of the Microsoft Paint sketch, we finally came up with the Omni cart. And I apologize for the name. I couldn't think of anything better, which when you pull the handles on the sides, the center drawer module slides out, and uh, this is still going strong. It's patented now, and in my mind, I'm already thinking ahead to 
to not to get out of the medical field and maybe make it uh, a quick change of tools for maintenance. Maintenance has a number of different toolkits. Maybe we can have a quick swap. But I wasn't happy, right? I'm not really happy in the medical industry. That's why I left, really one of the reasons why I left in the first place. So then I opened up a furniture company called Modern Workspace, Furniture for Smart People. And it's technology furniture, a lot like some of this stuff that you guys are seated at. Um, and it's still going strong, but I'm still in the furniture business. Like, I want to do something with the military. I want to do something in veterans. That's where my passion is, right? That's what I'm meant to do. So finally, after trial and error and starting businesses, I landed on an online magazine called WarriorLodge.com for active duty veterans and people who were thinking about joining. Lots of cool information, top 10 lists, quizzes, good articles from people all over the DOD. And you'll notice advertisements here and here and throughout, you know, they're, they're not overbearing ads, but they pay for the site. And then a little extra. And what's interesting, if I can have a digression here, there's uh, the key to making money on an online magazine, it turns out, is Facebook. So you start a Facebook business page, get a whole bunch of followers, 66,000 likes, and then you start a meme war. You get the branches to fight amongst each other, right? And we're all on the same team, so it's all good natured. But I threw this down the other day. Marines after the ASVAB. And the Marines responded, it's okay, Airman, it's supposed to make that loud bang sound. <laughs> and of course, somebody always, during these meme wars, somebody always takes a shot at the Coast Guard for some reason. Why? <laughs> what did the Coast Guard ever do to anybody in the history of the military? Nothing at all. So quit picking on the Coast Guard. I live in a Coast Guard town in Michigan, so. Another great organization, Veterans in Film and Television. This is a nonprofit that if you have any interest in acting, directing, producing, writing, uh, this is a, a nonprofit that will help put you into those roles and link you up with the people in Hollywood. And you can see what it looks like. This is my profile for people to be able to find me Hollywood producers to be able to find me. Mainly I made this because of the documentary that I'm shooting, The Forgotten. Um, but it's just a great avenue to go through that route. Everybody see Star Wars, the new one here? So Kylo Ren, through veterans in film and television, landed this role, uh, Adam Driver, as Kylo Ren, who was a veteran, um, Marine Corps veteran. Another Great business. Anybody heard of Grunt Style? Yeah, they make fantastic t-shirts. And we're talking about uh, a, an ex-drill sergeant, an ex-army drill sergeant, somebody that can actually uh, follow their dream of being a business owner, having been in the military, and using those hard military skills to be able to achieve that success and run a multi-million dollar t-shirt business. And then just to round it out, has anybody heard of Matt Best? Yes, Matt Best, definitely popular. A YouTube celebrity. Yes, an internet celebrity is a thing now in our society. And it pays extremely well. And at the same time, because of his YouTube platform, he's able to get his message, his veteran-focused message out to his 50 million subscribers. Right, so it's absolutely Fantastic. And what you're seeing from these successful veterans is that it's possible. Right? You're made for success. The profession of arms has built you for success. So what's in your toolbox? You already have this massive head start because of what the profession of arms gives you. But what other tangible things can I kind of throw into the mix to make sure you guys are really geared up for success? Well, the first step is absolutely Really identifying that thing that you want to do with your life. What is that thing that truly brings you happiness? Don't sabotage yourself before it even begins, right? Okay, listen up. This part's important. Choose your group of friends very carefully. Very, very carefully. If we're talking about money outside of the military, where pay isn't strictly defined by grade, what you'll find is that you are the average, your pay is the average of your five closest friends. When I found that out, I was making friends with some rich people real quick. 
right? You're going to have those people in your life also who are doubters. Wait, Wes, you're going to start your own business? You're going to go out and talk to people? That's not you. They laughed at me. They're going to laugh at you too. And the bigger your idea, the bigger your dream, the harder they're going to laugh. Why? Because your success reminds them of a time that they tried and failed and didn't get back up and revisit it again. Right? And even your friends and family may be envious of your ambition. And this is so dangerous because we have self-doubt ourselves. Everybody has a little bit of self-doubt, right? And if you start hearing these things from loved ones about why you shouldn't do something, don't do that. You already have a good job over here. You're making good money. Don't follow your dreams. <laughs> you start to have that self-doubt creep in and get louder. And it could sabotage you. And you might quit. And then 10 years down the road, you're going to see somebody making a million dollars off of your idea. And you're going to kick yourself. You're going to say, man, I knew that was a good idea. And one more thing about people. If you're the smartest person in your group, you need to find a new group. When I started MD Advantages Healthcare, I called a meeting of my department heads, and I told them, the day that I walk in here and I know more than you guys, you're fired. I guarantee they stayed ahead of me after that. You need to surround yourself with people that constantly challenge you. Do not be the smartest person in your group. You need to be able to stretch yourself. You need that person to stretch yourself. It's a hollow victory to be smarter than your friends. So there's a man I follow on YouTube named Eric Thomas, and he's got this uh, one message about average, and I wanted to share it real quick because it's, it's incredible. And he says, you need to get off average, right? Nobody likes average. Your instructors don't like average. Your boss doesn't like average. Nobody really likes average. Success is allergic to average. Success won't have anything to do with average. So do me a favor, the next time you give a low effort, the next time you give a 30% effort, or a 50% effort, or a 70% effort, I want you to go back and think about what you were thinking about at the time you gave that low effort. And I'd be willing to bet you were thinking, I got to versus I get to. You were thinking about the obligation and not the opportunity. You have to become that type of person that sees opportunity in everything. Wait, Wes, how can I find opportunity in homework? You have to become that type of person that sees everything as opportunity. Opportunity isn't something that comes around once in your life and you're lucky if you grab it. You can create your own opportunity. And it sounds crazy. Wes, stop. How? How do you create opportunity? Because it sounds great. Sounds like a great little motivational fluff thing to say, but how do you create opportunity? And let me give you my personal example of that. I wanted to speak at TED. I teach predictive analytics at Baker College. And so I have something to talk about. Information is beautiful. How data visualization will save the world. That's what I want to talk about. I found out the TED people were coming to Grand Rapids to a Rotary Club meeting to give a short presentation about why TED is great for the community. So I snuck in to the Rotary Club. And I filled out a name tag and I stuck it on me and I sat down and I'm mingling with complete strangers acting like I belong there. Oh yeah, oh me, I'm new, I'm new here. And after the TED people gave their short little speech, I walked up to them and I said, hey, I wanna speak at TED. I have something great to talk about. And they said, okay, come by the office and give us your pitch and we'll see if it's good enough. You have to be able to create opportunity. You have to be bold. Don't, don't, don't compromise your integrity to do it, but you have to be bold. Opportunity is everywhere, and you have to change your mindset and be able to start looking at things through the lens of possibilities. Another great topic, another great tool to have in your toolbox. Start thinking of life as this massive maze, right? Not life here, life after you've separated from the military. If you're in the market for, you know what, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I'm gonna start my own business, I'm gonna start a bed and breakfast, whatever the case may be, you can start thinking of life as this massive maze. You come into it, there's a million ways to die, there's dead ends, you get turned around, you could spend a decade and $10,000 going after an idea that could lead to a complete dead end, right? And there's only a couple paths through this thing to success. There's only a couple paths. This is the reason why I stress the importance of a mentor. Find that person who's doing the thing that you want to do. 
you have to find that person doing the thing that you want to do. And you have to attack them. You have to approach them and you have to say, hey, how do I do that? I want to do that. Right? They're going to know the path through the maze. They're going to save you time. They're going to save you money. It might not guarantee your success, but they're going to make it much more likely that you're going to succeed. And it can be intimidating. You have somebody who's a CEO. If you know what, if I wanted to make cell phones and Steve Jobs was still alive, I would drive out there and track him down uh, to try and say, hey, how, do you, how are you doing this? You know, do, do not be afraid to be able to approach these people. All right? If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Or as my mom used to say, a closed mouth never gets fed. All right, when you're working on your goals, I want you to aim high, right? Most people fail in life, not because they aim too high and miss, but because they aim too low and hit. You have to aim high. No idea is too ridiculous. I made a promise to myself 20 years ago, and you guys will be one of the first to see this. I told my wife 20 years ago, that I'm going to run for president and win the, the presidency in 2032, right? This is, this is my promise to myself. 20 years ago, I made this promise. Yes, Wes is more. I made this promise to myself 20 years ago. Ridiculous. I told my wife this, and she surprisingly kept a straight face. And she looked me in the eye, and she said, yeah, OK, let's do it. I believe you. I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it, I'm fortunate to have somebody who supports me on that journey, but what if I don't get elected president in 2032? Just what if? It's in my mind, it's already happening, but what if it doesn't happen? Imagine the things that I will have accomplished along the way. And this is the importance of making big goals. Make the biggest goal you can think of, and then work towards it with your smaller steps. Wes is going to be, wants to serve his country, he's going to be a military veteran, a business owner, a speaker, a professor, a senator is next, and then hopefully name recognition by 2032, enough to be able to win a general election, or at least to get nominated. So you have to be able to shoot for the moon, as Les Brown says, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll be out among the stars. No idea is too big. And the most important lesson of all, really, is that you have to want success bad. I mean, you have to really, really, really want it. And there's this success guru that came to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he was giving a motivational speech to a bunch of people. And this guy came up to him after and said, hey, I want to be just like you. I want to be successful. What's the trick? What's the key? And he said, I'll tell you what. You want to know the secret to success? Meet me at the shore of Lake Michigan at 4 AM tomorrow morning. And so he said, 4 a.m., okay, I guess so. So he goes out there, dressed in a suit, looking nice, on the shore of Lake Michigan. Sure enough, the guru is there waiting for him. And the guru says, all right, come with me. And they both start walking out into the water. And the guy's like, why, why are we going out into the water? And he says, you want to be successful, just follow me, keep walking. And so eventually, the water is waist deep. And they keep walking. And when the water gets to about neck deep, the guru stops him. And without any warning at all, he grabs him by his shoulders and plunges him down under the water. And he holds him there. And after about a minute, the guy is scratching and he's clawing and he's starting to tremble. And after another minute, the guru thrusts him up out of the water and says, quick, tell me what you were thinking about just now. What did you want more than anything else? And he says, I just wanted to breathe. And the guru says, when you want to succeed, as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. You have to want it that bad. And you know what? Most people won't make sacrifices now to get that reward later. People are soft. This is a soft generation. People give up on everything out there. People will not sacrifice this comfort now for more comfort later. You have to be willing to live like most people won't so that you can someday live like most people can't. Right? When we talk about failure. We talk about failure in the profession of arms. We say failure is not an option. Failure in our job as military members could mean failure of the mission, our death, the death of our allies. 
and potentially the death of civilians. And society reflects this. We hate it when our sports team loses. If you fail a class, you have to retake it. But in my world, in the world of entrepreneurship, this thinking is really, really dangerous. It's because of this allergy to failure that people who are following their dreams to try and pursue these big ideas give up after just one failure. So do me a favor. I'm not asking you to get comfortable with the idea of failure, but I want you to start looking at failure as something positive, as a good thing. Right? A lot of people think that failure is a step backwards. No, 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 no. Failure is a step forward, a step in the right direction. Every time you fail, you learn something from it. You gain something from it. You have less anxiety about it the next time you're doing that same task. You're going to tell me that that's a step backwards? That's progress in every sense of the word. Nobody ever tells you this, but you're supposed to fail. It's part of the process in entrepreneurship. All roads to success, you've got to go through failure and pain to get there. I had a point in my very first year at MD Advantages where I had hit rock bottom. I had just taken my family from a six-figure income to below the poverty line. We were on welfare while we were trying to get this business off the ground. And I got to a point where I wasn't seeing any results. I wasn't seeing anything. I didn't have faith that what I was doing now was going to pay off later. And I actually broke down. And I concocted a way in my mind to drive my car off of a bridge and commit suicide and do it in such a way that it looked like an accident. That way my family still got the life insurance money and would be set. That's the brutal low low we're talking about here when you fail and you have stuff on the line, in my case, a wife and three kids. That's the brutal low that you face. And you have to be able to find that something within, right? If it was easy, everybody would do it. You have to find that thing inside you. And that's got to push you. And that's got to motivate you. So you're definitely going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs. Anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they're in happy relationships. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can be positive then. Anybody can have faith under those types of conditions. The real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. It takes courage to get back up after life punches you in the face. And, as I said before, as my mentor Les Brown said, you want it, you've got to go all out to have it. Whatever it is, it's not going to be easy. If it were easy, everybody would do it. But if you're serious, you'll go all out. I'm in control here. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for your character. Take full responsibility for your life. Accept where you are and the responsibility that you're going to take yourself where you want to go. You can decide that I'm going to live each day as if it were my last. Live your life with passion, with some drive. Decide to push yourself. The last chapter to your life has not been written yet, and it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. What matters is what are you going to do today? Today I'm going to make this decade my decade. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Anybody can start something. You, my friends, have already started this amazing journey. The question is, how are you going to finish? And I want you to take the lessons learned from the profession of arms into the outside world and leave your mark on the world. Thank you. That's it. All right, thanks, sir. All right, guys, hit me with it.
Yes. Oh, so where in Michigan are you from? I'm from Michigan. Oh, uh, Muskegon, Grand Rapids okay. area, close to the Big Lake. Okay. It's beautiful here, but we have a different type of nice flat inland sea right. beauty. And we don't see the sun during these months. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry. What are some mentors you've had? Mentors that I've had? Uh, probably my biggest mentor was my uncle, who was actually in the furniture business. Um, he, <laughs> this is not a good example, he dropped out of high school in 11th grade, and now he's worth $230 million, and he just had that passion and drive. And I hate to say that, I don't want to, I don't want to send the message that education is not important, because it really is, and he's a fluke. But he was already doing that thing that I wanted to do. Um, and then I had a couple of other uh, people that were in the furniture business, people that were in the online blogging business. So uh, I had a mentor named John Brossi. John O'Donnell was my uncle. John Brossi. Um, yeah, and there was a couple other uh, bloggers. I did read a lot of books. Um, I definitely read a lot of stuff on how to run a successful online magazine and actually earn revenue. Um, and, and Warrior Lodge, uh, I think, has, has turned out very well. So, yes. Yes, sir. A couple times they use the phrase, it's easy for everybody to do it. I'd like to challenge that a little bit. Please. If it's easy, nobody would like to do it. Yeah. Uh, I think that the human spirit craves a challenge. I'd like to hear some of your perspective about that. I agree. And that, so did everybody hear that question? Yeah. So humans do love a challenge. And that's absolutely correct. What I would argue is that um, if there are easy roads to success, and that is easy roads to being financially independent, um, you would have a lot more people doing it than are currently doing it. And by being hard, by being as brutal and filled with pitfalls and failure as it is, it really weeds out the people that aren't meant to you know, achieve, I guess, the goals that many other people are achieving. Um, but your point is very well taken. Um, humans, by their very nature, love a challenge. And we're a little biased in this setting at the Air Force Academy because we were surrounded by high achievers. Um, they probably don't need to hear my message. You guys are already high speed, low drag, steely eyed killers. <laughs> so, um, anyways, yeah. all right. Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about how during one of your uh, startups you had three kids and your income had drastically decreased. So can you expand a little bit more on how you're able to balance um, your ambition for you and your family and also providing for them and the values? Of you? Yes. You know? if, I, if, I had, if I had it to live over again, knowing what I know now, I would have kept some sort of employment and started a business simultaneously. I would have done them at the same time. I had about $60,000 in my life savings after I left this German medical company. And we had to live off that, not just pay the bills and feed a wife and three kids and have a roof over our head, but we also had to put some of that money into the startup to try and get it going. I had to pay a graphic designer and a CAD artist to come up with that Omnicart design and everything that I could take to a manufacturer to get it manufactured. And so it's extremely challenging. And I would argue that people seek out the opportunity and the way to be able to keep a full-time job and still start a business. Because for that first 12 to 18 months, it's, you're not going to see any profit in most companies, unless you have an outside investor, which I didn't. I didn't seek investors. I wanted to own 100% of my company. So I don't owe anybody anything. So it's tough. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious. You said something I think along the lines of you're the smartest person in your group. You should probably find a new group. Yes. However, what do you do if you can't get rid of that group? You know. So I'm thinking of family, right? <laughs> 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 I mean, you can't right. parent them, no. and they're great. But yet, I know that I'm living a path that's leading to greatness, right? Right. But I want my family to excel with me. I'm not trying to leave them in the dust. No, so no. So how do how do you? Bring them with you. Absolutely, and that's, and that's a great point. So in that case, you are going to have to be the motivator. You take on that new persona, that new role. I am the motivator. I can't get rid of my group, so I'm going to resolve right now to take them with me. I'm going to resolve to lift them up to where they need to be to be able to fly on my wing, to be able to stay with me and not fall behind. And that's going to be a huge task for you. 
it's going to be a huge undertaking um, when you're responsible for people like that. Um, if you're the best and the brightest, now you, you know, as, as, a, as a leader, now you're responsible. Um, but that's a tough one, yeah. You can't just walk away from family or in a case, you know, in a military setting, you can't just go to, go to the chief and say, I want a new squad. You know, or in my case, go to my first sergeant in the army and say, my squad is picking on me, you know, I want to go to a different squad. It doesn't work like that. So, yes, sir. When you uh, first started your company uh, and all the other uh, projects that you've done, how did you surround yourself with a team that would breed success? Like, how did you pick those people uh, that you wanted around you? You're like, so you're not going into a company where there's already people there. Right. So how did you attract those other people to come to you? Yes, and that is one of the most important points about running a successful business. You have to be able to have control, and I hate human resources. I hate them. <laughs> and and I, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but I've always had bad experiences with human resources in every company I've been in. Um, but human resources play such a crucial role. The business is only going to be as good as the people that you bring into the business, as the people that you hire, right? And places like Apple and Google are what's known as a preferred employer. They have people lining up outside, waiting to walk in the door, waiting to get a job there. And so as a benefit, that gives Google the ability to take the top pick of the talent. It's almost like the Air Force Academy. You have people lining up trying to get in. Well, the Air Force Academy can, cho can pick and choose the top talent that they want to make a high-performing organization. Um, for me, for a startup, I don't have people lined up outside. They don't even know about me. So it was just a matter of me really going out and seeking those people that I wanted to be associated with. And LinkedIn was a great resource for me at the time. Absolutely, LinkedIn allowed me to, I don't know how they're doing these days. I don't get on too often, but yeah, LinkedIn was huge for me in the, in the early days. So, yes sir? In your opinion, what is the best way to generate startup money, like Kickstarter or angel investors? Yes, um, so if you don't have it yourself, uh, the absolute very first place I would start would be friends and family. Um, second, I would take a look at my credit. And uh, I, I'm not saying this as a recommendation. I took out three credit cards and maxed them out. I was killing my credit. I'm gonna kill my credit to make my company successful. I'm gonna pay any price. I'm going to do as many push-ups as it takes, as many reps as it takes, right, to make that company successful. Um, so foregoing that, angel investor is absolutely the number one spot. Depending on how big your startup vision is, an angel investor will usually be the first stop and will usually satisfy you know, any needs that you have. Um, and of course, there's the angel, in, angel investor network. You can find them online in every city. And don't be afraid to go in there have them sign a non-disclosure agreement that you can print out online for free, take it in there with you, and then pitch them your idea and see if they want to give you some money. Uh, just know that you give up a chunk of control every time you take somebody else's money. That's the only, that's the only drawback. And they might not have the same creative vision that you have right, for the future of your company or your idea. So, yeah. Yes, sir? Do you think that um, in today's environment with the internet and everything like that, that there's more opportunity or is there so much opportunity that it almost kind of chokes out a lot of other ventures? Like, do you think that it's, it's easier than it was? Right. Or do you think that it actually presents more challenges? That's a, that's, that's a good question and I'm gonna tell you why. Because it is easier right now than ever to make money as an entrepreneur. Um, especially online. So you can open an e-commerce store where you drop ship stuff. You don't, I don't keep any inventory in my house for Modern Workspace. All I do is connect the customer to the supplier and I exchange the money and manage the customer relationship. I don't even see the product they're buying. And you make money that way. It's really easy and even with an online blog, with, an, with an online magazine, it's easy to make money. The problem is, is that as easy as it is for you to do that, it's also easy for you know, 40 million other Americans who are looking for that you know, self-help, that entrepreneur opportunity. And so everybody's doing it. And the competition is brutal. And when I started Warrior Lodge three years ago, it was just me and military.com. That was my main competitor. Now there's task and purpose, and we are the mighty, and a whole bunch of 
Warrior Scout. There's a whole bunch of veteran focused, um, I guess, online blogs that generate revenue from advertisements. So it's tough. So it's good and it's bad. I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it's brutal, but at the same time, the opportunities are there. You just have to execute better than that person over there that's trying to get the same thing you're trying to get. So. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one. Yes, sir. So you mentioned a lot of benefits uh, for uh, veterans in terms of entrepreneurship. So going the other way, are, are there things that need to be picked up in the military that hinder us uh, from succeeding as entrepreneurs in, in the civilian world? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay. I haven't seen anything. And I'm, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But in every interaction I've had in small business, and I run three small businesses, I've never seen a veteran come in and do anything that was a detriment to mission accomplishment or to more revenue, generating more revenue. I could probably brainstorm in a situation that might occur where maybe they weren't, maybe they were using lingo that only a Marine infantryman knows to a customer. Um, but by and large, they're always professional because of the profession of arms. That's been my experience. 